Hello and welcome back to this course on post-colonial literature. Today we are going to take up the writings of uh, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, who is one of the most influential uh, critical voices, uh, theorists in the field of post-colonial studies. Now I am sure that by now, after going through the previous lectures uh, in this series, in this course, you have realized that at the most fundamental level, postcolonial studies is an exercise in ethics. Uh, one of the main agendas of postcolonial criticism has been the dismantling of the Eurocentric worldview, which colonialism had naturalized and which had in turn marginalized numerous indigenous cultural and epistemic traditions across the colonized parts of the world. The other agenda of postcolonial studies has been to foreground the voice of the oppressed and to create conditions, at least within the academic institutions, so that the people subjugated by colonialism can be heard. Both of these efforts, these ethical interventions, I would call them, are already prominently displayed in the works of Edward Said, the founding figure in, uh, within the field of post-colonial studies. And uh, in Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak too, we find a continuation of this ethical imperative that underlines post-colonialism. Um, now, Spivak's ethical intervention is most associated with her work with the subaltern. And here I am uh, talking about work, when I am talking about work, I am not only thinking about her academic writings, they are important, yes, we are going to discuss them, but I am also thinking about her work as a teacher and activist among the landless, illiterate population in the villages of West Bengal. Um, so, Spivak's ethical intervention is characterized by her work with the subaltern, for the subaltern, uh, both as an academic writer, theoretician and as an activist. And indeed, at least within the academic circles, Spivak's name is today most widely associated with the highly influential essay titled, Can the Subaltern Speak? So, in this lecture, we will try and understand the contribution of Spivak in the full field of postcolonial studies by focusing on her elaboration of the term subaltern. But before we do that, let me introduce Spivak to you. Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak was born in Calcutta in 1942, and it was a time when the British Raj was fast losing its political grip over the Indian subcontinent. And these last years of the colonial rule was marked by calamitous you know, violence. The Bengal famine of the early 1940s, which was triggered by the opening up of the Pacific Theatre during the Second World War, um, left literally thousands of skeletal human bodies dying in the streets of Calcutta. And if you remember, I had mentioned in one of my earlier lectures that although we are primarily going to talk about colonialism and post-colonial legacies, resistance to colonialism, etc., in terms of uh, cultural uh, colonization and cultural resistance, uh, nevertheless, we should never lose sight of the physical violence that characterized colonial rule and colonial subjugation. And uh, so, as we see here, Spivak, who was to emerge as one of the foremost post-colonial theorists, grew up witnessing some of the most gruesome incidents of violence that were brought about by the colonial rule. And uh, also, ironically, by 
the middle class nationalists who uh, in a place like India touted uh, the promise of ending British rule and its evil. So, if we read Spivak's writing, we will see that when she is talking about uh, this uh, brute physical violence uh, to which she was exposed as a child, she is talking about um, a strange nexus between the British colonialists and the middle class nationalists. Uh, indeed, for someone living in Calcutta during the 1940s, the violence of the artificially created Bengal famine uh, was only surpassed by the violence that marked the birth of India and Pakistan as two distinct nation states in 1947. And uh, this birth of uh, India and Pakistan was uh, made possible by a pact that the middle class nationalists and the British colonialists had made together. And it was basically a pact. What the pact actually meant was a carving up of the communities living together in the subcontinent for ages, carving them up into citizens of two distinct nation states. And for young Spivak growing up in Calcutta, uh, this pact did not translate uh, so much into the abstract idea of freedom as to the more real spectacle of blood on the streets. Now, uh, just like Punjab, um, Bengal was also the site of partition and of gruesome violence and Calcutta was uh, one of the cities which witnessed uh, the most horrible scenes of um, crime and violence during the partition period. Thus, in her essay, Nationalism and Imagination, Spivak writes that her earliest memories as a child are those of seeing blood on the streets and she emphasizes on the statement, she says that they were not metaphorical blood, they were real blood coming out of killed, colonized subjects. And therefore, um, we need to remember that the blood in this picture of colonialism and post-colonialism is not metaphorical, is not cultural but real. Physical violence was a real um, fact that informed colonialism. And the very fact that Spivak recalls these memories later on as a post-colonial intellectual to think through the idea of nationalism and the role of aesthetic imagination uh, in, in, uh, in conceiving nationalism, this shows how post-colonial high theory can grow out of, an, out of one's engagement with the physical violence that has always underlined colonialism and its legacies. But this raw physical violence apart, which colonialism and nationalism uh, exposed to Spivak, uh, Spivak as a child was also exposed to some of the forces resisting this carnage, this violence. And uh, this force for Spivak uh, was primarily uh, the force of uh, the um, Indian People Theatre, Indian uh, People Theatres Association, for instance, which was an association of leftist artists who um, were trying to raise social awareness during this period of time through organizing street theatres and through very popular songs that were introduced during these theatres. So, Spivak also remembers these theatres and these songs uh, produced by leftist artists. And indeed, political leftism and engagement with the writings of intellectuals like uh, Marx and Lenin uh, have remained prominent characteristics of Spivak's work. Uh, Apart from this leftist current, Spivak's intellectual horizon was also shaped uh, by a thorough exposure to British literature, which uh, she received as a student of the University of Calcutta. After graduating in 1959, uh, Spivak moved uh, to the West, 
where she completed her master's degree at uh, Cornell University in the United States of America. And this was followed by a year of fellowship at the University of Cambridge. Um, for her PhD, she again returned to Cornell University to work on the poetry of W. B. Yeats and she worked under the supervision of uh, Paul Deman. And Deman is noted uh, for, among other things, his efforts to import the insights of Jacques Derrida's philosophy of deconstruction into the field of literary studies. And Spivak too following the lead of Deman has remained strongly enthusiastic about deconstruction throughout her um, career as an academician. Indeed, uh, Spivak first came to international limelight as a critic uh, when in 1976 she published um, an English translation of Jacques Derrida's uh, De la Grammatologie uh, under the title of Grammatology. And uh, she published uh, this translation along with an extensive commentary on the text which formed the translator's preface. Since then, Spivak has gone on to publish a number of books including uh, In Other Worlds, Outside in the Teaching Machine, A Critique of Postcolonial Reason, Death of a Discipline, Other Asias and more recently. Uh, aesthetic education in the era of globalization. However, as I have uh, told you near the beginning of this lecture, Spivak's most influential and recognizable work has remained Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, and the first version of this essay, indeed this essay has a number of versions now, but the first version was published in 1985 in a journal called Wedge. So, let us now turn to the notion of the subaltern and to the question that Spivak so famously asks in the title of her essay, Can the subaltern speak? Now, before we start exploring who or what is a subaltern and before we start answering can the subaltern speak or not. Uh, it is essential to clarify at the very onset that though Spivak has occasionally been mistaken as the founder of the concept of the subaltern, this concept does not originate in her writings. In fact, in Can the Subaltern Speak, we see Spivak engaging with versions of the concept of the subaltern which was already strongly established before she came out with her essay. But the very fact that today the word subaltern immediately conjures up the name of Spivak tells us something about the impact that Spivak had on elaborating the notion of the subaltern. Now, let us again return to the word subaltern and uh, as by now I am sure you will know, uh, my favorite habit is to first go to a dictionary and see what the dictionary tells us. And in this case, if you go to a dictionary, you will find that the meaning, the original meaning of the term subaltern was a junior ranking military officer. And this particular use of the word subaltern in fact is still very much uh, prevalent within the military uh, even today. But in the field of critical theory, because we are concerned with critical theory here, the term can be traced back to the writings of the early 20th century Italian intellectual Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci, who was a very prominent Marxist intellectual, Marxist theoretician, uh, used the word subaltern to signify a section of people who were subordinate to the hegemonic groups or classes. Now, to understand uh, this uh, definition, we need to first comprehend the notion of hegemony as it operates in the writings of Gramsci. Now, in its simplest form, hegemony can be understood as a mode of exercising authority. Now, if you think about the 
concept of authority, you will notice that one of the most obvious ways in which authority can be asserted and is asserted is through the exercise of brute physical force. Now, for instance, if I have a gun and I can terrorize you into submission, I can terrorize you into um, obeying uh, my instructions and fulfilling my self interest, uh, then that will be one way of asserting my authority over you. Right? That is very simply understood. And we can see how this form of asserting and exerting authority operates within a society. If we think uh, of the role that the police force, for instance, plays. However, Antonio Gramsci argues that there is also another way in which one can exert one's authority over another. Thus, for instance, if I can somehow convince you that whatever I do in my sort of to fulfill my self interest, whatever I do in my good also serves your good, it is also in your self interest. If I can convince you of that, then that is a more effective way of asserting my authority over you than using physical force. Because if I can convince you that my self-interest is your self-interest, then you will do whatever is required to be done uh, for my self-interest, I mean without any sense of external force, you will do it willingly because you have become convinced that whatever serves me is also good for you. So, according to Gramsci, within a society, the ruling class mostly asserts itself, mostly asserts its authority by this non-coercive method. That is by convincing the entire population that the interest of the ruling class is the interest of the entire population. Now, this non-coercive assertion of political authority by a particular class over other groups of people is referred to by Gramsci as hegemony. So, as I said earlier, hegemony in its simplest form is actually a mode of asserting authority. Now, to understand how hegemony works, let us go back to the discussion about Indian nationalism that we have had in our previous lectures. If you remember, we have uh, we had noted in those lectures that most of the figures who led the charge against the British belonged to a particular social class. And uh, I have referred to that social class following Sumit Sarkar as the middle class. And be it C.R. Das, for instance, or M.K. Gandhi, or Jawaharlal Nehru, or Subhash Chandra Bose. Uh, we have seen how all of these uh, people, they share similar career trajectories. But when we think about them, we do not conceive them as middle class heroes, but as national heroes, heroes who spoke not on the behalf of uh, a particular class the middle class, but on the behalf of the entire nation. right? And Gramsci would argue that such ready acknowledgement of middle class heroes as national heroes is an example of the hegemony that the middle class has exercised in post-colonial India over all other groups of people and how the middle class has managed to convince all the other groups of people living within the subcontinent that what is in the interest of the middle class is also the national interest. So, according to Gramsci, if Gramsci were to read the situation, it would be something like this that post-colonial India has been characterized by the hegemony of the middle class where the middle class 
has been able to convince the entire national population that whatever serves their interest is also in the interest of the nation, which is why for instance, we do not regard um, people like M. K. Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, C. R. Das, Subhash Chandra Bose as heroes or representatives of a particular class, but rather as national representatives. Now, this Gramscian understanding of the term subaltern was taken up by the influential group of South Asian historians who formed the subaltern studies collective in the 1980s. And this group of historians whom we refer to as uh, the subaltern studies group or subaltern studies collective, they were primarily studying post-colonial uh, societies, post-colonial India, post-colonial South Asia. And one of the most significant figures within this group was the historian Ronojit Guho. And uh, Ronojit Guho in his essay titled On Some Aspects of the Historiography of Colonial India gives us an account of how the group Subaltern Studies Collective was using the word subaltern. In his essay, Guho writes that the term subaltern is oppositionally related to the term elite. And for Guho, who in his essay, in this particular essay that I have just mentioned, uh, was working from within the context of colonial India, the term elite was constituted not only of uh, the European colonizers, but it also included um, dominant indigenous groups who had access to hegemony either through their association with the colonial government or through their western style education or in case of big landowners for instance or industrial and mercantile bourgeoisie through their wealth. Thus, in a more general context, the term elite represents all the sections of a society which have political and economic agency, right? power to act out their self-interests and desires within the political and economic arenas. That is what an elite is. So, in other words, the elites are the people who can intervene and articulate their self-interests within the field of politics and economics. And Guho defines the subaltern because he said that subaltern is oppositionally related to the elite. Subaltern is the opposite of the elite. So, Guho defines subaltern as all those people within a society who do not fall under the category of elite. So, here subaltern is not really defined as a special class or caste or race, but rather subaltern represents a negative space or a negative position. It is a position of disempowerment, a position without social or political agency, a position without identity. Now, Spivak um, and can the subaltern speak that essay, uh, as I said, engages with these existing definitions of the subaltern. So, she engages both with Antonio Gramsci as well as with uh, the essay of Ronajit Guho that I have just mentioned. But uh, for Spivak, and this is Spivak's intervention, she characterizes subaltern or she identifies the characterizing feature of this subaltern position as that of being unable to speak. Again, to repeat, for Spivak, the characterizing feature of this subaltern position is that no speech is possible from here. So, in other words, the answer to the question, can the subaltern speak, according to Spivak, is an unequivocal no. The subaltern cannot speak. Now, the terseness of this assertion has often led to confusion about Spivak's intent and she has also been criticized for 
an attempt to silence the subaltern. But Spivak's argument is really simple to grasp. If we understand speaking as generating discourse. Now, if you recall our discussion of Michel Foucault and discourse in uh, one of our early lectures, you will know that we had defined discourse as meaningful utterances. And we had also discussed how within each society there are checks and filters which allow certain utterances to be accepted as discourse and certain others to be rejected. So, theoretically, though anyone can speak or write infinitely on any given topic under the sun, what will be accepted as discourse and what will not is ultimately determined by the power equations that underline the society. And this is a known fact, so I am not going into further details about this. Uh, but let me give you an example. For instance, in a society where the dominant power structure equates reproductive heterosexuality with normalcy, it is very difficult, if not altogether impossible, to generate discourse regarding the rights of homosexuals. So, the position of the homosexual in a society underlined by reproductive heteronormativity uh, and uh, reproductive heteron heteronormativity is a term that Spivak uses. It basically means um, regarding reproductive heterosexuality as the only normal mode of sexuality. In such a society, homosexuals take up the position of the subaltern because discourse generation about homosexuality by the homosexuals become impossible in that society which regards heterosexuality as the norm. And it is a position of disempowerment, a position without any access to agency that will enable one to define one's own identity and it becomes impossible to generate discourse from within this subaltern position. Now, this is, however, not to say that the physical act of speaking is impossible uh, from within the subaltern position, but it is to say that this speech never gets accepted as meaningful utterances which carries the weight of sociopolitical agency and which can articulate self-interest and self-identity. So, it has been argued by some scholars that rather than saying that the subaltern cannot speak, it is more apt to say that the subaltern cannot be heard by the society, just like uh, the mad person cannot be heard by the society because her speech is considered as vacuous. Now, such rephrasing of Spivak's insight is uh, perfectly all right, provided we understand that both the statements subaltern cannot speak and subaltern cannot be heard refers to the same inability to generate discourse from within the subaltern position. This is a complex issue and it will uh, become more clear in the next couple of lectures where we will again take up this uh, concept of uh, subaltern and we will take up the writings of Spivak, but we will apply them to a short story by Mohasheta Devi. And if we read uh, the notion of subaltern with the help of this story by Mohasheta Devi, which Gayatri Spivak herself has translated, I think this complex issue about the subaltern position as well as um, the possibility slash impossibility of subaltern speech will become clearer. Uh, we will continue this discussion in our next lecture. Thank you.